So, um, the, as I was saying earlier to, to Jean, um, a, a bit like a, a, a psychoanalyst, I think we all need a little bit of psychoanalysis or at least psychotherapy after that uh, brilliant documentary. Um, a good, a good psychoanalyst um, should say absolutely nothing and their, their, their patient should do all the talking. So I guess uh, rather than, as a moderator, I, I will try and say as little as possible, um, but I will ask a few, uh, shall we say, uh, stimulating uh, uh, questions, or hopefully stimulating, but questions with the goal of, of, of inspiring, um, uh, conjuring up, if you like, igniting a, a, bit of a, a bit of a conversation that can then run its own course between the panel and, and, and you guys. I'm sure you have a huge number of, of questions. I will um, only rely on, on the one formal uh, strate strategy of, of asking each panelist a question and you, you'll answer it and then we'll, um, we'll just sort of hand it over naturally to, to the audience. So I hope that's, um, I hope that's okay. I will, um, if everyone's ready, does, is everyone settled and have a, have a, um, have a, have a seat? Is it? How about that? Is that better? Yeah, it's just the distance. Sure, good. I think it's sort of natural that I would start with um, Andrew uh, Feinstein here, who is the author of the book on which this documentary is based. I'm sure you've all worked that out uh, already. It would be, uh, I guess, uh, most natural I would, I would start with Andrew such that we can uh, also, I would hope, address one of the more difficult uh, questions that at least uh, I and, and it seems many many people that have watched the documentary, film reviewers have uh, have also uh, encountered. Um, and, Andrew, many uh, reviewers have found themselves um, both uh, profoundly moved and yet somewhat utterly depressed um, watching Shadow World, um, the film based uh, so closely on your book. Clearly, uh, this is not a topic that um, that many would digest so easily. I mean, as, as far as the general audience is concerned, or even uh, possibly wish to begin digesting at all. And so it follows that, um, that this would seem due in part to the, to the sort of natural or endemic reflex to, uh, which I, I guess I'd refer to as ontological preservation, that, that you'd simply prefer to not know that you were living in a world quite so damn awful, you know. Um, in any case, do you see this aversion to the dark topic um, mm. problem? Mm. Um, as somewhat plaguing efforts to broaden understanding of such a primary world-shaping market machinery as the arms trade, and if so, what would you say might be done about it? I think, ooh, um, the problem of the darkness of the film, and I think it is worth saying, so this is the book on which the film was based. It's 555 pages long. It has 2,800 footnotes. And the reason for all of the footnotes is not only because I think it's very important when doing this sort of work that it is factually based. And I think notions we have of sort of post-fact or post-truth worlds that, that we've seen become more and more popular in, in, in discourse over the last year or so I mean, we've always lived in a post-fact and post-truth world. And I think that speaks to part of the problem of all of these dark topics, as Chris Hedges says in the film. You know, if we actually saw the real images of war on our television screens or in our newspapers, I think that far more people, after all, whose tax euros are being used to sell the weapons, are being used to fight these wars, I think a lot more people would be completely outraged by what is being done in their name and with their tax dollars. I don't think it only applies to this particular topic. I think that subjects that subvert the established order to get across, extremely difficult to get any sort of access to mainstream media. Um, I think it is made easier by social media, but it creates its own difficulties and complexities and problems. Um, but I think the most important thing that we can do, and I think probably what all of us sitting here and a number of people in the audience devote their lives to doing, is to ensure that these sorts of topics, that this sort of information does get into the public domain as much as possible. And for me, I should just say, Working with Johan Grimonprez, the, the Belgian director of the film, who is 
actually better known as a visual artist, um, was incredibly challenging. But at the same time, it's been extraordinary for me to see how much easier it is to engage with people using a film. And of course, a 90-minute film is always going to have its limitations. And when people say to me, you know, and many people have from the time we first showed it at the Tribeca Film Festival that I think you were at, um, a lot of people walk out of the film and saying, I'm feeling depressed and angry. And I say, good. Because if you're aware of this stuff and you're not depressed and angry, then there is even a bigger problem than we realized. And I think what we have a responsibility to do and why myself and Johan and some of my research colleagues spend an enormous amount of our times going around with the film, we work with partner organizations in many parts of the world, is telling audiences exactly what they can do to channel that anger. And I think that is really the key. And I think we're very fortunate tonight, and thank you to the organizers, to have a panel here where we can talk about a lot of that stuff. Well, what do we do now? And that, for me, is really the strength of using the medium of film. Excellent. Great. Exactly uh, what I'd hoped to hear somehow. Um, now, um, I'll move on to you, uh, uh, Lisa. Uh, the, the, I guess one of the uh, most uh, sort of startling um, things about, um, about coming across you, Christelle, is, is, is the person, Christelle Vu here, is the person entirely responsible for this panel. And she introduced me, um, uh, if you like, in your absence, to, to you and, 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 your, and your work. Um, one of the most startling things, I think, is, um, is, is seeing the, the, the title Drone System Technical Sergeant, um, which is just such an, it's, it itself has a certain opacity and might be difficult for, for, for many people to even unpack. Not only is the, is, is, is the language um, a little outside of the scope of, of common parlance, but it also indicates to itself, in, in itself, that there is this world unto itself that, that has its own um, um, assignment of titles and roles and jobs that most people would never even know existed within their various romanticisms of, of what, a, what a military d uh, deployment or project entails. So could, could, you, um, could you tell us a little about the work uh, that a drone system technical sergeant entails and how and why you chose to leave and speak out against the US drone program? That would be the first question. And, and then secondly, as you well know, the, the, the Rammstein um, airfield here in Germany um, has played an integral role within drone command in Afghanistan, Somalia, Pakistan, I believe Pakistan, and, and most certainly Yemen. Um, and this is a, a very recent and highly controversial discovery for, uh, for Germans. It's, it's very upsetting because the German government denied any knowledge of the fact that Rammstein airfield was being used as a relay for the control of, of, uh, of, 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 these, uh, of these drones. Have you ever visited Rammstein as a function of your work and could you tell us why Rammstein is so central to the operation of, of drones within the US, uh, US program? So for your first question, um, for those that don't know me, my name is Lisa and I'm uh, recently in a film about uh, the drone program which will be opening here soon. Um, but I can't tell you what I did. I'd love to tell you, I want no more than to tell you every little detail about what I did, but I like being free. And if I were to do that, um, I wouldn't be free very long. So I can't tell you what I did. What I can tell you is that nothing about any of the drone bases is really an integral part of the drone program. Um, and I think that th that's something that we need to do is to not assign like hierarchies to this base or that base. The fact of the matter is, is that we're all complicit. We are all complicit in this. If we pay taxes, if we are silent, if we don't ask the mainstream media to show us what's going on on the other side of the world, then we are all complicit. And it's really unfair for us to, like a lot of people hold the military responsible. We're talking about 18 to 24 year olds and what we call um, conscription is the poverty draft. And a lot of these 18 to 24 year olds know about as much about the drone program as you do, which is pretty much not much at all, right? 
and they don't know and they're told by recruiters you know about how good it is and at one time the drone program did something called overwatch and basically what it did was it looked down on troops and said this person is planning a bomb maybe y'all want to go take a left and then we did what we often do put a weapon on a thing and once we put a weapon on a thing the mission changes and it goes from something that's supposed to be protect and defend to basically what I call terror. And we have this framing about terrorists, good terrorists, bad terrorists. The fact of the matter is, is that right now, all of us sitting in here, if we had a drone flying over our head, or the possibility of a drone flying over our head, and nobody is immune to that at all, um, any one of us, from a doctor to a toddler to anybody, could get blown up, we would all be terrified. And we need to start considering these words that are used, um, like fake news is a lie. And we need to demand the truth. Um, and we need to demand of our public officials the truth. I was in the military and I went to a funeral service for a good friend of mine, one of the people who died in the Iraq war early on, because they didn't have up armored equipment. And they didn't have safety stuff. And when I walked into that church, I want you to know that I saw all these injured people. I should know that because I'm in the military, right? I didn't. I did not know that so many people were dying in Iraq, like a lot of us didn't know. And as a public, we need to start, you know, we need to start asking for that information and demanding it of our news media and demanding it of, of you know, both the fourth estate, because the fourth estate has failed, Right? We wouldn't have a problem with propaganda if the fourth estate worked. So, yeah. I hope that answered. Pretty much. Thanks. Um, now, uh, uh, Jean, uh, you're, you're the, um, uh, one of the uh, more prominent figures within the, um, within the German uh, uh, art and activist, sort of this, this hybrid... Um, scene space of, of certainly um, I would say that pink collective your collective is probably the most <coughs> rigorous um, European wide and it's, it's an interesting time to have you in fact a quite a, um, a pleasantly uh, specious time to have you in this panel um, given your uh, your recent campaigns against um, the the German arms trade which I, I guess many people even Germans don't realize is is counted by many as being the the third largest exporter of arms, particularly small arms, um, these very famous brands, I guess you'll, you'll, you'll mention that. Um, so not only could, could you tell us a little bit about your recent campaigns, but also um, why you believe activism and art together, conjoined, um, comprise a, 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 a powerful toolkit for fighting such a goliath um, as, the, uh, as the German market for, for, for arms. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so um, yeah, it's, it's very it's like it's very hard to start talking about this because there's this general anger and depression in, in this room, and I, I'm um, yeah, I'm bowing my head when I hear what you're doing, when I see your work, um, and then to come up and say, well, I'm the guy who's uh, whose job is to make fun <laughs> in this domain. It's it's not easy actually sitting here. Um, still, that's what we do. And the, because uh, I believe one of those most uh, amplifying or those moments where you can free yourself of, of um, inability paralysis is through laughter and, and through, you know, trying to find out new forms and experimenting and constantly like searching and so that's what we did with the arms trade. We do it with all kind of like topics where we feel it's there's not enough being done, uh, secret services, and, you know, whatever, like all those um, areas where we, we feel there's not enough being done. And so in this case we researched for like half a year. We met, we met you already, we, we talked to a lot of experts and Ottfried also and all those people with those massive brains who told us uh, all those details. And um, so our analysis was what, what can we do? And it was like attack the, the, close, the, the politicians who are supporting them, which is the CDU in, in Germany, the Conservative Party. They're the strongest political allies of the weapons industry. Um, 
and then you have to attack the products, right? Like um, this is what they hate. So this is when when they want to enter a market and they've got a, the brand is damaged, <clears throat> like Hector and Koch is right now entering the U.S. So you attack the brand, and people, you know, then say it's a it's a shit company, whatever, and they won't buy it. Third is to pull them into, as you keep underlining, uh, shed a light on them and, and take them out of the, of the dark. So we designed three actions uh, doing exactly that. Um, I mean, I can tell you now or later what we did. Um, and, and why art? I don't know. It's like, it's just a way, it's, it's, you know, it's a pill uh, which is giving me comfort of like <laughs> relaxing a little bit out of all because these. So certainly, uh, there's, there's a, there's a, seems to be this endemic, almost a depression of its own within the contemporary art uh, universe among, um, among uh, fine artists that, that, that they are the detective that turns up after the crime, that they can't actually enact change, that they're always too late, as, as it were. And, um, and that there's a disempowerment among the arts. You know, I, I think I teach art students myself, and I've, I come across that quite often. Um, what I, I love about about you, the work that you're doing at Pen Collective is is it, it clearly evidences that art can um, can comprise can manifest as a as a very very chiselled um, finely honed uh, toolkit for uh, for productive disruption you know and, and this, this is this is so refreshing and encouraging. Um, you said you had a video or two of that you'd like to show. We, we can, uh, we, we can, I can maybe you just go on and then I load it on YouTube or something. Okay, sure. I mean, yeah, it's English English keyboard. Just, yeah, just, I can do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Let's do that, and then we can yeah watch that. Yeah. Because I, I mean, I, the question is art or not. I don't know if we're doing art actually. We've been we've been invited more and more by the cultural institutions, which is a bit difficult for me as well because mm. we are we're coming from social movement we are activists and then we of course yes we do things that open discourse we're not just like doing the old old you know attacks but still uh i mean the art well i'm sure many artists will say well this is not uh, like artistically aesthetically it's not interesting it's like activism whatever i'm, I'm totally fine with that yep. um and and uh, this is another discussion uh i think it's frustrating that we are getting way easier funding from cultural institutions mm. than from political institutions. Mm. And there's something severely wrong with our civil society, <coughs> I mm. think. And we're getting a huge grant from the cultural ministry, which is mm. CDU, Monika Grütters, to subvert, you know, the CDU. Yeah. Which is great in a way, but it's also like, hey, guys, why, why don't we have institutions to mm. pay political activism and, and to experiment and to, like, subvert, you know, power systems in a way. I, I like how, how Pen Collective doesn't, um, doesn't deploy it and name it as an, as, an, as an art artifact, but you use the tools and techniques, long histories of intervention and mm. um, uh, public performance. You know, the Yes Men would be the, the only other immediate sort of reference. Um, yeah, let's, uh, let's move further down the line. Um, now, um, uh, Xanth, is that, a, is that a correct pronunciation? Yeah, it's very good. Excellent, I'm pleased. <laughs> now, you, you're... Um, you're uh, a key uh, member of this, of, of, a, of a very um, necessary um, organization within, the, within the, the broader European body as regards nuclear disarmament. Um, but it's one, I must say, that, that I was embarrassed to, to, to realize that I had never even heard of it. Um, I'd never even heard of. Uh, and, uh, once I started doing a little bit of digging after uh, Christelle had, uh, had sent me some links, um, I was su surprised at just how much Hello and of, of, of a legacy you, you have um, behind you there. Um, you, you, you're particularly interested in money making and nuclear weapons. And there was this quote in, in the film which, which uh, I thought was, was certainly quite haunting, quite chilling, um, that, uh, that the, the modern military marketplace is, is, is concerned with privatizing that most basic um, public function, which is a very difficult sentence to say, that basic public function, war, you know. Um, and when we start, the, the idea that, that, that war can be a public function, let alone can, can build around itself a marketplace that can, can then um, f uh, fund the development and proliferation of, of, of absolutely existentially primary threatening um, um, implements like nuclear arms, is, is, is just very difficult to grasp. Um, but y maybe you could talk about the, uh, the connection between the, the modernization of the 
US uh, nuclear weapons complex. Maybe Trump in there somewhere with his new plan to stimulate the nuclear arms um, uh, race all over again. And particularly the companies that uh, profit from it, but also UK and France, if you could. Yeah, um, well, behind the shadow world is another shadow world, and that is the nuclear arms part of this equation, because um, when we think about the arms race and, uh, and the arms trade, most of us think about the, the weapons that are being used all of the time in the wars that we hear about. But at the same time, behind this is also the ultimate weapon, which is nuclear weapons. And these can't be used. There's a, there is a taboo that says you can't use nuclear weapons. We can only talk about threatening to use nuclear weapons. And, um, but this has also its business side. And um, in, instead of going the way that m my organization wants to go, of getting rid of nuclear weapons, which are completely unacceptable as, as, a, as a weapon. Not that any weapons are particularly acceptable, but those that destroy the planet, I think we should all be able to agree, are completely unacceptable. Instead of doing that, all of the nine nuclear weapon states are modernizing their nuclear weapon systems. And this has been going on for some time. It's only just beginning to come into the media when we talk about Russia. Nobody really talks much about the U.S. Uh, nuclear weapons complex, which has been already for um, the last 10 years or so, the planning has been going on. Now it's full into production. Various warheads have already been modernized. And um, uh, we're even looking at one of the modernized uh, weapons coming to Germany and replacing the 20 nuclear bombs that are based in Büchel in Germany. So that, that's coming around 2020. Maybe Godfrey can tell us the exact date, probably. But I want to talk about the money that's behind this because this is where we think that we can do something because it's all very well protesting, it's all very well doing great actions, talking to politicians, even going to the UN and, uh, and talking to diplomats, which we've been doing for many years. That's why people don't know us, because we don't talk much to, we don't get onto the newspaper, into the newspapers or onto the television, because nobody's interested in nuclear weapons. They really aren't. Yeah. And so we go straight, for the diplomats because they have already committed in various uh, um, treaties to getting rid of nuclear weapons. So we think, okay, we'll go and talk to them. And we found this way now through a new treaty which is being negotiated this year to ban nuclear weapons. You never heard of that, I bet. Nobody here except one girl at the back who works with me. Nobody has heard of the fact that we are this year going to ban nuclear weapons, but we are. And while we're banning those nuclear weapons, we're going to put into the treaty that every country that signs onto the treaty, and we have about 130 countries already ready to sign up, that they have to, on a national level, divest <coughs> from, from nuclear uh, from nuclear. Uh, weapons companies, companies that make nuclear weapons systems, that make the delivery systems uh, for those nuclear weapons. Now we're talking, they were all mentioned in that film, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, um, General Dynamics, Honeywell International, they're all there. Yeah? Those are the big names, they're the ones that get billions and billions from modernizing these, these nuclear weapons. So what we're saying is, and you can all do this too, you have to think about which bank you're with and do they invest in nuclear weapons. It's quite simple. We've made it really simple because we've made a web page that you can go to. It's called don'tbankonthebomb.com. Or if you're German, it's atombombengeschäft.de. So... It's really, if you want to find out more about it, you just go to either of those websites, find out what, which are the financial institutions in your country that are investing in nuclear weapons companies and, and uh, you divest yourself. But also, 
it's really important that each country that signs on to this treaty also makes this decision to di divest um, from, from nuclear weapons companies. The only problem is that German, it, Germany will not be one of those countries for quite a while because of the nuclear weapons based here. I could go on all night, but I think that's about enough for now. You'll have plenty, plenty of opportunity again uh, uh, in a moment. Excellent, thanks. Now, um, Otfried, um, you're the director of, of BITS, uh, B-I-T-S, uh, the Berlin uh, Information uh, Center for Trans, uh, Transatlantic Security, which is itself a, and, and, and just an, inc an incredible thing that, that this um, organization w would, would exist. And, and, and sadly, even in some ways, need to exist. Um, that m one must have a monitoring body keeping um, account of of, of, of this, uh, the transatlantic situation, as it were. I guess one of the well, the big questions for, for Germans, especially after uh, Rammstein, you know, the, the German government saying expressly, absolutely, in no way are we involved in the in the deployment of. Of, of predator and reaper drones in, in, in these countries, et cetera, et cetera. The, um, the, 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 the German position within the global arms market, uh, it, it would seem to be absolutely out of step with, the, the, with Article uh, 26 of the, uh, of the German constitution, which, uh, which expressly states under the title uh, securing international peace, that acts tending to and undertaken with the intent to disturb the peaceful relations between nations especially to prepare for a war of aggression, shall be unconstitutional. They shall be made a criminal offence. Number two, weapons designed for warfare may be manufactured, transported or marketed only with the permission of the federal government. Details shall be regulated by a federal law. And yet so many German weapons end up in the hands of, of, of of uh, drug lords, child soldiers. Um, they somehow manage to magically evade um, export trade regulations. Uh, where, where do you see the, 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 the real position um, that the German government and, and, and the, the jurisdictional system has with this, this, I guess you might say, jarring collision with the very constitution itself? Where, where are we at today here in Germany? What's the situation? <laughs> uh, our constitution was written they really after a war lost. Uh, so there are some formulas in uh, that lay, were later partially reversed, at least in sense. Uh, and if you look at the last sentence, which he quoted, saying details will be uh, worked out in, in uh, separate laws, uh, that has been the way how to, uh, to do that. Uh, when the German law on, on uh, war weapons uh, was and, and their export was uh, written in 1961, Germany was in the middle of build, rebuilding its own, uh, own armament in, uh, industries. And when uh, the other uh, trade on, on foreign, uh, foreign trade law was 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 combined um, or was put together um, at the time uh, Germany already had a number of exporting companies by the way, this is only half of the truth because when Germany was forbidden to produce arms uh, until to nineteen fifty six they already had again companies that produced arms uh, and also sold them. Uh, they were only, uh, they were not, not named uh, weapons of war at the time. Uh, and I think no, nobody should be astonished that it is like that. Everybody wanted Germany to be organized um, as a capitalistic econ economy. And in a cap capitalist economy, uh, producing and uh, making profits from, from from weapons is one of the really important uh, ways to make money as well as to promote certain politics. Uh, and that is um, what Germany uses arms exports for until to today. And I 
don't, I don't bother whether in, in certain statistics we are uh, the third biggest, second biggest, or fourth biggest uh, exporter. The problem is always the same, that there is exports and that they are huge and that they are made to enable people to earn money, to, to enable a private industry uh, to earn its money. And um, in a capitalist world, it's absolutely logical that companies like that uh, want to, m to earn more money each year and, uh, and, and, and try to uh, create growth. Yeah? It's, it's almost like um, a little bit like what Switzerland is to watches, you know, Germany is to, is to, is to, is to guns, you know, rifles and pistols and, and the like. There's this, there's this idea that a German, a German weapon is, is um, particularly a German bullet firing weapon, is the best of breed or something like, like that. And not really. Uh, not, really okay. not, not really, but um, watchmakers are both... Uh, present in Germany and uh, in Switzerland, uh, and both, com by both, both countries therefore um, produce excellent fuses for ammunition. Ah, uh, fantastic and detail, actually. <laughs> <laughs> that's because that's exactly the same technology which, which you need for both, yeah? yeah. Uh, and that is another thing which, which I think is, is astonishing while we are always discussing about exporting tanks, aircraft, etc., uh, etc. Et we very, very seldom worry and discuss ammunition yeah, uh, yeah. as yeah. what yeah. is really what kills, yeah? Mm. Uh, <laughs> so, and we also don't discuss things like fuses. Yeah, it's a, it's actually, it's a little bit reminiscent of, the, of the, the revelation recently that the British government had okayed the, the, and, and cleared the, the the sale of um, of the components that make sarin gas to, um, to 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 Assad effectively the sarin same sarin gas that was used um, in, in that in that it's recent the same way as we show on the film America knew at one point that Saddam had chemical weapons mm. they sold him some and, indeed weapons. absolutely yeah and we the other ones yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. yeah just to finish um, our, our our little sort of introduction introductory um, um, walk here, a laufen. Um, uh, Barbara was supposed to be here on the panel tonight. Um, and Barbara. Uh, and, and <laughs> actually, um, Barbara um, unfortunately couldn't make it due to her feeling not so well today. Uh, I found myself a little bit unprepared, unfortunately, but I'm very grateful that you could turn up as her colleague. Um, uh, and uh, I, I, would, I would just ask that you um, literally just introduce yourself and talk about whatever you would like in relation to the topic. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I must apologize. But no, 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 no go worries. For go for it. So my name is Pratap Chatterjee, and I work for an organization in Berkeley, California called CorpWatch. And one thing that, uh, it, it was actually quite, in, this is the second time I've seen the film, but um, this, this is, it's, 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 it's a bittersweet moment, shall we say, because I was supposed to be in that film, but I, I ended up you on the, I uh, ended up on the cutting room floor. <laughs> but uh, it's, most of the subjects are actually very close to my heart. I wrote a book about Halliburton. It's called Halliburton's Army, in which I discussed the role of Dick Cheney and how he profited out of actually the first Gulf War. Um, it's also there are references in the film, and, and, and Lisa's talk to drones. I have a new report coming out probably the end of this month, which actually looks at and answers actually many of your questions exactly what all the positions are in the drone war, who are the companies that supply to them, and how does the system work. So please look out for it. I'll be speaking on a panel tomorrow um, at ECCHR about that, yeah. Uh, and I, I spoke earlier today at Republica. Um, but, um, and, 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 and actually, I wanted to actually address a, a little bit of the question that you asked, uh, Otfran? Otfran? Yeah, yeah. Um, because I think, um, I, the question reminded me of a book uh, for which I did some research on, which came, came out maybe almost 20 years ago now, called Private Warriors. Andrew probably knows it, by Ken Silverstein. And this was not the subject of my research, but when I read the book, I was struck by a German export that I was not aware of post the Second World War. And it was the export of people who understood the systems of how to supply weapons, particularly ammunition. Mm -hmm. 
and maybe Otford can speak more of this, I don't know if it's well known in, Ger in, in Germany, but after the Second World War, the assumption was, you know, with the Nuremberg trials, etc., they got rid of all the people who were involved in this, you know, dangerous business of, uh, of, of war and the people that had been involved. But actually, that was not true. America welcomed, and I think yeah. it, it's probably in, it's, it's actually in this book, America welcomed the arms traders. And to this day, those people, I think some of them are probably still alive, um, those people are actually deeply involved, particularly, perhaps that's not now because they're either dead or really old, but if you go back 20 or 30 years, post uh, the Yugoslav conflict, mm. the, the people that were involved in delivering weapons, actually even in Afghanistan and Iraq right now, w when you hear about the weapons that are, and the ammunition that is delivered to the war zones of the world, this is a legacy of a system that was set up by America in conjunction with essentially the former German experience. Right, so it's not just the Army. building of weapons, it is the trade in weapons. Yeah. Now, I don't remember, I read the book, the book came out 20 years ago, and I, I don't really remember <laughs> it. But I do remember this, and so I was struck by a question, because I think it is really important for people to understand that despite Article 26, that trade continued and has continued every day. So when we talk about Rammstein today, and Lisa's very right in saying, Rammstein is just one part of a machine. And it is actually really important. I know there are people who've talked about how Rammstein is pivotal. Every part is important, whether it's Menwith Hill in England or, or uh, um, Pine Gap in Australia or, or, or the Beale Air Force Base near where I live in California. Each part of this, what's called a distributed common ground system, the, 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 the brain of the drone system, is equally important. Nobody is less uh, complicit. And it is a system designed, like the Nazi uh, war machine, for everybody to play a small role in it. Because if at one point one person is responsible, it becomes very difficult to sustain the system. It is more important to separate each component and split them up because that way you can, you can continue uh, a machine, a machine of war and death, right? But it, it, well, in, in the case of Rammstein, it's very much of, uh, of, of redundancy. It is also, I think, the, the, the role of Rammstein, because I know Lisa couldn't really answer this question, but as I understand, and I'm not an expert in Rammstein or Germany or any such thing, but um, uh, most people think of the drone war as a war of weapons and a war of killing, but actually, that's really not the most important part of it. Drones, only maybe 1% or 2% of drones is actually killing. Um, and in fact, even the people who are the pilots, etc., who watch and uh, the sensor operators push the button, their role is not actually killing. Their role is surveillance. And that's why Rammstein is important. Because Rammstein, as I understand it, and, and I'm no expert, I actually really just learned this today, so I, 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 this is hearsay, but was created as a base to help collect information from uh, uh, Eastern Europe, the former Soviet Union, et cetera. So that's why it's so important. It is important because it was a, uh, um, and I, I'm, again, I'm not researched this, I just learned this today, but it, it played this role in collecting information, doing surveillance, in transmitting information. And that is its role today. Absolutely. I, mean, in, in, uh, I have a particular fascination with, uh, with, with, with surveillance and the electromagnetic domain. And one of the things that, uh, that I read was crucial with Rammstein was, was that many of the, the, the drones that were controlled through that relay, so if there's, there's a fiber optic tunnel coming from Nevada, I think Creech Center mm -hmm. in Nevada, all the way of the fiber optic cable, and then up to, um, um, uh, through, through to Rammstein, and then up to a, a, um, a satellite, and then, and then controlling the, 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 the drones in those regions. Much of the time, the drones were engaged in a sort of reconnaissance, weren't they? Where they had um, uh, IMSI catches, which effectively hook up catches, mobile, yeah. phones, uh, mobile phones. Also made um, in Germany, but it comes to that road. Exactly, Schwartz, exactly. Yeah. And temporarily um, uh, isolate a phone number attached in the form of a, of a device, obviously, to a person, such that they can then literally kill by phone number um, a, a, little, a little later down the road. And in fact, this apparently was was how um, uh, bin Laden himself was, was tracked much of the time. And they're constantly swapping through burner phones. But the, the idea is that you, brief, you fly a drone over, you hook up people's phones, 
you, um, you have their unique IMSI number, which is the number behind the phone number, if you like, and then you the can I then track... The IMSI number, actually. Or the IMSI, the IMEI is the, is the hardware, the, oh, the, right, right, the right, SIM right, card right, is the right, IMSI. Right, yeah, yeah, and yeah, then you can, you can hook them up and then locate them later. No, no, no. Yeah. So, okay, yeah. And the, yeah. you know, and anyway, it it's, 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 yeah. IMSI catch up. Yeah. Uh, uh, right, 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 right. Okay, never mind. Uh, there's, there's about, we, we can talk a acronyms over a few beers later, but I'm a dork for this stuff, I love it. Um, anyway, yeah, this, this, this is a very good point. Um, look, well, with, with, with all of that, and, um, and there just being such an incredible wealth of, of, of knowledge um, right here, um, we, we, we will open it up to just uh, a free, free form um, um, and very organically evolving uh, conversation with the audience. But, but Gene, you wanted to show a video first that I think would be, a, would, would be good to do round about now maybe, eh? And then, and then we can just... Yeah. Yeah. Can I just add to Rammstein? We had a little experiment there. You can actually, it's very easy to fly a drone <laughs> over Rammstein. <laughs> and, and seriously, it's like no one ever will stop you. It's like super easy. It's not very well controlled. And I know, I mean, I don't know why no one ever went there around the base and put the water off. It's like, it's seriously, it's, it's still happening in Germany. You can like, okay, we'll do that. you know, there's so many things you can do. Just, just, you know, experiment. But uh, I'll, I'll show you. Actually, you, sp you spoke about uh, Article 26. Um, so I forgot to say we uh, have written, as the, because it's like the rest is like, we have written five different laws that we will try to bring into the parliament. And uh, one of them is a complete stop of weapon export. So you can vote uh, which law you want us to try to push into the German parliament. But first, like the first story here, I, I swapped. Um, it's like basically three hacks we did. One is we, we disguised the CDU and we uh, asked Merkel to stop uh, small weapon export and it went to Fox News and, and, and New York Times. It worked very, very well. Um, now, this, this sweet little girl is explaining how she is hacking um, uh, Hacklen Koch. Hacklen um, Koch, genommen. Die haben nämlich nur 700 Mitarbeiterinnen. Eigentlich super easy. Ihr guckt euch einfach an, auf welchen Markt die jetzt nächstes gehen wollen. Weil Hacklen und Koch zum Beispiel krass viel in die USA liefern, schickt ihr denen dann Briefe und zwar an die lokalen Dealer und sagt denen, die sollen die Waffen wieder zurückschicken, weil, weil kein konfliktfreies Land mehr ist, wegen Trump und so. Und weil wir ja in Deutschland den Artikel 26 Grundgesetz haben, ethische Werte. Genau, deswegen sollen die jetzt einfach alles wieder an uns zurückschicken. Aber nicht an uns, sondern an Hitler und Koch, weil ich meine, die tun ja so, als wären wir die. Damit das alles auch nochmal so richtig feiern kann, legt ihr euch nochmal auf in den Online-Portalen von so Waffen-Nerds. Okay, so, so we did that, and um, uh, Hecklen Koch on the website they put a huge banner that they are victims now, <laughs> which is really funny. <laughs> but yeah, so let's see if they really are. Cha they they want to chase us, they say, and they want like you know. Well, let's see if they try. They uh, yes. <laughs> so then the next one, I'll, I'll go quick because it was a. Yeah. Das Problem ist ja, dass Merkel und Zypris, das ist unsere Wirtschaftsministerin, voll hinter diesen ganzen 